Uh, well, first of all, a word of gratitude to the organizers of this event, particularly to the Jordanos, for giving me the opportunity to share with distinguished speakers this symposium, and also to share with you. Uh, my presence here uh, obeys to the deliberate purpose of ruining your Sunday, definitely. Okay, so I will try to not to ruin too much. Uh, one of the worst things that can, can happen to you in a workshop is to speak after Enrique. This is terrible, you know, Enrique, <laughs> Enrique is so enthusiastic and uh, he has a very beautiful story that is really unbeatable. So, uh, but uh, a secret between you and me, he's a professional actor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, late Peter Sellers will envy him, you know, because he's, he's, really, he's really something. <laughs> okay, now, uh, going into my talk, uh, as you may see by the title, this will be really an overview of the subject of uh, uh, the evolution of the uh, application of, industrial, of enzymes to, to industrial uh, operations. So, uh, the presentation will be divided in three uh, points. The first one is to show you precisely what is the evolution of, of enzymes from traditional applications in hydrolysis to more evolved applications in synthesis, then to speak about the current applications of enzymes in industrial processes as process catalysts, and finally to give some perspectives. Okay, enzymes are proteins, good start. The thing is that uh, by being proteins, enzymes are primary, primary gene products. It means that anything you make to a gene will reflect in a, uh, in a structure uh, change in the protein. And this is very important nowadays with the modern techniques of genetic engineering and protein engineering. But, uh, well, enzymes are really alloenzymes, so they contain also non-protein components, and, and uh, between those non-protein components, the one which are important to us is the catalytic non-components, which may be coenzymes or cofactors. And this has a profound impact on the technological application of enzymes. We can, from that perspective, divide the enzymes in, in three groups the one which do not need of any enzyme or cofactor, so the, the, the protein is sufficient for catalyzing the reaction. There's a second group in which there is a, a tightly bound cofactor, a cofactor that remains tightly bound during the, the, the reaction. This is, in most cases, not a very difficult technological problem, but there's a third group of enzymes which are the enzymes that require of dissociable cofactors, which are called coenzymes, because in this case, the use of such enzymes is much more complicated for some reason that we will we'll make clear uh, later on. If you see the, the traditional six families of enzymes, you will see that the only family that do not require coenzymes or cofactors in, in much cases, is the case of hydrolysis. So, no wonder why hydrolysis have been the enzymes that have been mostly used, because they are more simple to use. Maybe they are shaped to function as catalysts outside the cell environment, so this is not surprising. Uh, the rest of the enzymes will require either cofactors or coenzymes or both, and this may complicate this, uh, their technological application. The application of enzymes for industrial purposes have suffered a dramatic change in the last, uh, let's say, 20 years from traditional uh, reactions of degradation, which involve a really modest added value, and this was done by enzymes normally in solution, catalyzing mostly hydrolytic reactions. And some immobilized enzyme 
catalyzing hydroly hydrolytic reaction and some isomerization reaction. But the trend moved from this kind of processes to processes of synthesis, where the potential added, uh, added value is much more significant. Problem is that the enzyme that do that kind of job, at least from a, from a physiological point of view, are enzymes which require this coenzyme. So their use as catalysts outside the cell environment uh, have to face several cha challenges. But there is another possibility, which is to use the enzymes that do not require this coenzyme, mostly hydrolases, but in order to use an hydrolase to produce a reaction of synthesis, you will have to manipulate the environment because this enzyme is tuned to catalyze reactions of hydrolysis. But the same enzyme can do the opposite, can form that bond that in the presence of water it will break. And this uh, opens up really a fantastic opportunities for using traditional enzymes but in non-traditional processes. The first type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, reaction of synthesis is illustrated, for instance, this is just an example, in the case of the production of a chiral alcohol from a prochiral keto group uh, using, uh, uh, in this, that case, some alcohol dehydrogenase, for instance. But as you can see, the production of this reaction, which is very interesting because these uh, chiral products can be intermediates of a bunch of important products for the pharmaceuticals and the fine chemicals industry. But in order to do that, you have to close the catalytic cycle. And this means that the cofactor, which is the one which is transferring the electrons in this case, has to be regenerated. So you have to face with the problem of regeneration of the cofactor, and this will mean that you will have to have, in most cases, an auxiliary reaction in which you will uh, involve a second enzyme, I think this is not pointing, no. second enzyme and a second substrate, and your product will be contaminated with a co-product. But there are several strategies that can uh, tackle these problems. I don't have too much time to go into detail, but there are several advances in that field that are opening up the opportunities of using that, that kind of enzyme despite the complexes that they uh, present. The other strategy which in principle looks more appealing is the use of hydrolases. What hydrolases? The hydrolases that have been traditionally used for, well, what enzymes? The enzymes that have been traditionally used by the industry. This is proteases, lipases, and glycosidases. But now we are using this enzyme not to break the corresponding bonds, but to form them. So we can use proteases to, for the synthesis of peptides, for instance. We can use lipases for the synthesis of esters and the bunch of products. Lipases are very nice enzymes for, for doing synthesis. Uh, glycosidases for the synthesis of oligosaccharides and glycosides. And in this kind of reaction, there is much more added value involved. The thing is that when you're using hydrolases for the reaction of synthesis, you should take into consideration that maybe an aqueous medium is not enough. Maybe an aqueous medium is not enough to do that, so come into seeing the non-conventional medium. Understanding by non-conventional, non-aqueous medium, and you have a lot of alternatives. Maybe organic solvents have been the one which have been mostly studied, even though uh, there may be some problem with the concept of chemistry that we will scratch uh, later on. But you have some neoteric solvents like, like ionic liquids, and you can work at very high substrate concentration. And in, and in such conditions, the reaction of hydrolysis can be reversed. So there's an option of manipulating the reaction medium in order to make hydrolysis do what maybe they don't want to do, but we force them to do the hard job of establishing bonds instead of breaking. Okay, that's uh, this, the, the introduction. Now, some current applications of enzymes as process catalysts. Uh, well, first of all, where, what are the, the, the presentations of enzymes uh, to the industry? Well, 
they have some very nice uh, properties as catalysts. They are high, highly selective and sometimes highly specific. They are highly active at mild conditions. This is very important. They have high turnover numbers and turnover rates compared with other catalysts. They are, are highly biodegradable. This is interesting with respect to chemical catalysts, which are not in most cases. They can be labeled as natural products. This is controversial, but in, in general terms, enzymes are considered natural entities, so they do not uh, uh, contradict the natural quality of the product which is produced by enzymes. But the, 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 the thing is that as catalysts, enzymes are quite complex molecules. They have evolved to perform a very nice and very specific job, and this has a price. And the price is that enzymes are molecularly complex, and this means that the production costs are high, and they are in general label molecules, okay? So they have a low efficiency of use. Of course, we are using enzymes for a purpose which is completely different than the purpose enzymes have in nature. So we don't have to be surprised about these the things, okay? Enzymes are usually not stable enough under process operation conditions. And compared to other catalysts, is, there are much more uh, uh, expensive to produce. Okay, enzymes have a lot of applications, but I will focus only on the industrial application of enzymes. But it's important to, to point out that there are other applications which are in other fields which I, don't, I will not touch. Okay, but industrial application of enzymes will be the subject of, uh, of, my, of my talk. Okay, next please. Well, the traditional areas of industrial applications are food and feed, uh, detergents, textiles, leather, uh, and, and uh, maybe uh, one example of, uh, I would say, paradigmatic application of enzyme in industry is the case of the Staley process that you can see in the next slide. Uh, this is a process which was developed in the 60s to produce glucose syrups out of uh, uh, starch from corn or from other uh, uh, vegetable products like potatoes, for instance, in the case of some European countries. And this was nice because it was a high tonnage process which was completely enzymatic. You have a first stage of uh, liquefaction or hydrolysis with alpha amylase followed by a saccharification step with glucoamylase to produce a high grade glucose syrup that was developed in the 60s. Uh, then immobilized enzymes came into play. I won't talk too much about immobilizing enzymes in this talk. I will talk a little bit more of immobilized enzyme in, in FOS. Uh, but in, uh, obviously immobilized enzyme produce kind of impact on the, on the biocatalysis because immobilized enzymes may uh, be in, increasingly more stable. They can be recoverable after use. The, you can develop continuous processes for using this catalyst and that means high higher efficiency of catalyst use. When you immobilize an enzyme, the expectation is that the efficiency of use of your catalyst will be severely improved, and it better be, because if not, immobilized an enzyme will make very little sense. Okay. They contribute to operational flexibility, different type of reactor can be envisaged. Uh, there is the possibility of a better control of, of, of operation. Uh, and something that maybe in the academy is not very well uh, uh, appreciated is that when you use an immobilized enzyme, your product is free of catalyst. And this is very important for industrial purposes. You don't have to take too much problem in, in activating and separating that, that protein because the protein will stay in a different phase where your product is. And this is very, very important. But of course, this has to be counterbalance with the additional cost of fabrication of the enzyme. When you immobilize the enzyme, you have losses. Not all the activity you put in is expressed, and you have to take, you have to uh, in, invest in time, in reagents, in supports, etc. But uh, by the, the 70s, uh, 
came into play the immobilized glucose isomeries, which is kind of a paradigmatic case of application of immobilized enzymes uh, at a high, uh, at a high uh, scale. And interestingly enough, these uh, enzymatic processes could be so, uh, smoothly incorporated to the stylate process to transform the glucose into different high fructose syrups. And this was a very strong impact. Uh, this is even now the most uh, important, I would say, a process of using immobilized enzyme, at least in terms of tonnage. About 10 million tons of high fructose syrup are produced enzymatically each year. So it's a very uh, huge uh, process. Uh, in the 80s or 90s, uh, it will start what, uh, what Uwe Bornscheuer has called the first wave of enzyme biocatalysis. Uh, Bornscheuer has published a recent paper in which he speaks of waves. I don't know if he's a surfer or what, but he looks this in waves, and he speaks of a first wave, a second wave, a third wave. What I have speak up to now is, I don't know, zero wave, I don't know, pre-first wave, okay, because the first wave starts here. Okay, well, he's much younger than me, so, so he can visualize things like that. And then uh, this first wave of, of catalysis implies the, the perception that enzymes can be used for synthetic processes, okay? Beyond the traditional uses for hydrolytic or degradation reaction or isomerization reaction, the view that now enzymes can be used for producing a uh, reactions of organic synthesis. You have the case, uh, the example of uh, penicillin amylase, penicillin acylase, excuse me, uh, immobilized penicillin acylase, which is an enzyme which has been used traditionally in immobilized form to produce uh, nucleot nucleotides that serve as building block for the synthesis of semi-synthetic penicillins and cephalosporins. And, uh, this is, that's okay. this is a mature technology which leave the previous chemical process, the Delft cleavage process, completely obsolete in a matter of 10 or 15 years. So now most of the amino penicillinic acid, which is produced in just industrially, which is more than 200,000 ton, uh, tons per year, is produced enzymatically. But the nice thing is that you can use the same enzyme to produce the semi-synthetic penicillins. And this is a new vision because you are using the enzyme now to construct a bond, but you are using the same enzyme that you used to break that bond. And this is a very nice concept that developed in the, in the, in the 80s, yeah, the 80s or 90s. Another big, big issue in that, uh, in that period was the development of the process for producing acrylamide. This is interesting because Enzymes now go into a bulk chemical industry. Acrylamide is produced in large amounts, and this process was an alternative to the traditional chemical uh, process for producing acrylamide. Acrylamide has a lot of applications. You can use it for producing plastics, polyacrylamides, which have a lot of applications, even for immobilization of enzymes. Uh, and well, well that, that process was developed by Rajon Mitsubishi Company, in which what they did, these are not exactly enzymes in the sense of entities separated from the cell system, because uh, what, what they used was fixed cells, which contained that enzyme in, inside the, the cell structure. Now, uh, these are cells of Rhodotorula, no, Rhodococcus, Rhodococcus, Rhodocrus. This, uh, uh, these cells have a very high uh, nitrile hydratase activity, uh, so they can produce acrylamide. They block the amidase activity because uh, it, uh, it competes with the with production of acrylamide and produce acrylic acid, so they block this and were able to develop an enzymatic process for producing this, uh, this acrylamide using these uh, uh, this cells, uh, this cells rich in, in nitrile hydratase activity. Okay, what was the, the, the advantages of, uh, of that process? Mild process conditions, non-toxic byproducts, and the possibility of attaining 
uh, almost complete conversion, conversion close to 100% yield. These advantages were strong enough to displace to a certain extent the former chemical process so that now there's a figure of about 30,000 tons per year produced by enzymatic uh, technology, which seems to be about 40% of the market. These figures are, I think, something like five years old, so they may have changed a little bit, but it reflects a very interesting thing when uh, an enzymatic process starts displacing a former technology. To do that, the advantages have to be very, very clear. If not, the thing is not going to work. Well, this is uh, uh, a projection of the market of, uh, of enzymes. This is very difficult to, to, to precise because different also give different figures. The concept of market is quite elusive. What is the market? Is China included or not? So these figures have to be taken with caution. But the, the, thing, the nice thing is the evolution. You see, you see that there is a rather exponential growth in the, in the enzyme market up to 2010 that is predicted to keep on that way for the next five years at least. From that market, this black uh, line divided what would be considered the, the um, I would say, the, the bulk industrial enzymes from the other enzymes which are used for in more sophisticated uses. Okay? So you can see that the, the bulk use of industrial enzyme represents uh, roughly 60% or 65% of the, of the total. Next, next please. Okay, how is this uh, market shared? Well, uh, you can see that the, the, the division of about one third uh, for, uh, for the called technical industrial enzymes, about one third used for food and feed, and one third for more special uh, uses, okay? That's the distribution according to the use. Next. Uh, another interesting point is that the, the producers of enzymes uh, are um, many, but the important enzyme producers are quite few. And you see that from the enzyme producers, almost 50% is covered by Novozymes, about one third by, by, uh, by uh, others, and 21% by DuPont who acquired Genencore. So you can see that two, two producers uh, represent about 66% two thirds of the total uh, enzyme market. And this is quite uh, important. No, no, wait, wait. Novozymes is a very interesting uh, example. Uh, Novozymes is the leader, of course, in enzyme production. And the philosophy of uh, Novozymes is to be the leader. Uh, Novozymes is always uh, interested in leading the field. If they don't lead, they don't like it too much. They want to lead, all the time to lead. And it's interesting to, to, to take, uh, to listen what Novozymes does. Novozymes is now heavily involved in the production of biofuels and most precisely in bioethanol and most precisely second generation bioethanol. Listen to that because uh, these guys knows what they're doing. And you're fortunate here in Brazil because you have Novozymes 10 kilometers away in Araguara. This is the central headquarters of Novozymes for Latin America. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. Okay, some perspectives. This is the situation more or less today. What are the perspectives? Okay, I, I quote Willy Brandt. The best way to predict the future is to shape it. I think this coin a little bit of what I want to say. Okay, if you read the 11 commandments of green chemistry, which are scratched here, you will see that enzymes as process catalysts, enzymatic processes, com uh, comply with these principles, with all these principles. So if you read it, that's the moment. go. It's not the, the moment to read it, but you will see that all these 11 commandments of green chemistry are fulfilled by enzymatic processes. And this is very nice. This is a very good news because it opens the enzymes and in predicted perspective in the, in the, in the near future. Next. Okay, so I will uh, focus mostly in 
one of these two things, which in my opinion are things that are going to lead the development of enzyme biocatalysis in the near future. One is the use of enzymes in organic synthesis, in reactions in organic synthesis, and the other is the use of enzymes in biofuel production. Next slide, please. Next slide. Enzymes in organic synthesis, may, mainly for pharmaceuticals and fine chemicals. Look, that uh, if you put general figures, you will see that the biotechnology market is really a very small share of the chemistry market. But the, the, the nice thing is that maybe in a reasonably optimistic projection, the biotechnology market by the year 2020 will be a more significant share of this market. So the opportunities for bioprocesses are really important uh, for the next 10 years or so. When uh, the enzymes knock the door of uh, this, the industry of organic synthesis, they were rather reluctant to open that door. Uh, enzymes uh, as catalysts for organic synthesis were considered too expensive. They were considered that only act on natural substrates and the synthetic uh, industry work normally with non-natural uh, substrate. They were considered only efficient on their natural habitat, which is aqueous. Uh, they are considered label and prone to inhibition, which is something that chemists are not always uh, trained to work with, uh, product inhibition. Okay, so this, this, this was the, 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 the problem that enzymes were facing to penetrate in the organic industry. Some of these have been changed, I would say, significantly during the last 10 or 20 years. Because, you see, as catalysts for organic synthesis, enzymes are highly specific, sometimes highly selective, they are highly efficient, they are highly active under mild condition, which is interesting for some applications in the fine chemicals and pharmaceutical industry. They are quite versatile, which opposes to a certain extent to being highly selective, but you have heard the, 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 the idea of uh, enzyme promiscuity, which is a very interesting concept. So they are quite versatile. They are environmentally acceptable or friendly. So this opened up a lot of opportunities for enzymes in, 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 the, in the production of, of, uh, of orga orga organic synthesis, in the, in, the, in the process of organic synthesis. Well, they can compete with chemical processes by reducing steps because they are more precise in, in their chemio, regio, and enantio selectivity. They can compete with chemical processes by producing enantiomerically pure compounds, which is the main issue for the pharmaceutical uh, production of chiral compounds. Uh, they can be uh, they can compete with chemical processes in terms of environmental impact, which is a very important issue right now. Uh, they can be rather easily integrated with chemical steps, so you can make hybrid processes in which one steps are catalyzed by enzymes and other are catalyzed by conventional organic chemistry. And uh, a very important issue is that you can use robust, commercially available hydrolases to perform synthesis. This is a very nice uh, characteristic. So I will illustrate all of these opportunities with just one example taken from scratch, just one. Com compete with chemical processes by reduction the number of step. Well, maybe a good example to illustrate this is the synthesis, the enzymatic synthesis of aspartam. Aspartam, as you know, is a leading uh, non-caloric sweetener which is now produced to a significant extent with, with, a, with an enzyme conversion, which has the, the nice thing that the, 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 the enzymatic system can allow to be more precise, so it will produce the exact configuration of this dipeptide. There are four possible isomers, which come from two right, regioisomers of aspartic acid and two enantiomers of, phenyl, uh, of phenylalanine, but the enzyme will choose the, the right, uh, uh, the, the right uh, isomers to produce then the, the product. So this has been a very nice example of the application of enzymes in the, in the, in the fine chemicals industry. 
well, compete with chemical processes by, by pro producing an antimerically pure compound. This is a very critical issue for the pharmaceutical company. You have heard of the, the sad story about thalidomide, where uh, the, uh, the drug was sold as a racemate, and one of the enantiomers the, the, uh, was uh, the, the one that produced the expected effect, but the other one was the teratogen. This is a very dramatic example, but illustrate the point that when you're producing chiral compounds, the uh, enantiomeric purity of the product is really something very appreciated. This is not so dramatic example. For example, the production of ibuprofen, uh, which also is a, is a, is a chiral compound in which the, the S form produces the desired effect. This is the eutomer, and the, the, the distomer is, in this case, is inactive. So the problem is not so critical, but it means that if you produce it by, by, by chemistry, you will end up with a racemic mixture. You have a, if you have an enzyme which is enantioselective, you will produce the pure uh, uh, active form. And there are technologies to, to, to produce. This is an example of a technology developed for the production of pure S ibuprofen, starting from a racemic uh, ester in which the enzyme could, is, is really a li lipase, which is acting as a hydrolase and is selectively hydrolyzing this ester so that only the, the, the eutomer is hydrolyzed and the, the distomer is, uh, is not hydrolyzed, so it is racemized and recycled. So at the end, you will end up with a pure product with a very nice in antiomeric excess of 93% or more. These are other examples of, uh, of that point, the production by Ivonic Tugusa of uh, terleucine. This is a chiral compound in which you do a reductive amination with a, an antioselective enzyme. Here is uh, the, the recycle of the, the, of the cofactor and you end up with a, a pure enantiomeric uh, compound uh, which is in this case an amino acid mixture, with a very nice regeneration of cofactor and a very good enantiomeric excess. Compete with chemical processes in terms of environmental impact. The, the example here is a very nice example. It, it refers to penicillin acylase, which uh, Roberto and I loved very much because they have worked very heavily on that enzyme. I, I used to work in that enzyme too, not so heavily, not so successfully, but we have shared this, this line of, of research. Well, as you say, as you, as you know, the, 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 this enzyme is used for the production of uh, amino penicillinic acid. Formerly, there was a, 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 a chemical process which involved a, a lot of, of uh, environmentally hazardous substances and very strong conditions. So, when you move to the enzymatic process, you end up with a very mild process. This enzyme op uh, operates at 28 to 37 degrees in a, a water environment at a pH, at moderate pH, and you can produce the same product without all these uh, complex chemical steps. So no wonder why this technology was rapidly consolidated and displaced the, 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 the chemical process. But there is another point which is related to the, the environmental impact. This is a calculation of the amount of, of, of chemicals that you need in the chemical process for producing one uh, kilogram of product, and you will see that you have to spend 6.6 uh, .6 kilograms of trimethylsilane chloride, etc., etc. Some of these compounds are very complicated in environmental terms. The enzymatic process, you only need 0.09 kilograms of ammonia and two liters of water. Well, okay, if you calculate the famous E factor of Sheldon, you will see that the amount of waste that you produce in this process is significantly lower than that. Nice thing is that when you use the same enzyme, not for hyd hydrolyzing penicillin, but for synthesizing second generation antibiotics, this kind of analysis is rather the same. So you have a definite advantage in terms of environmental uh, view when you use a, 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 an enzymatic process. Well, 
Enzymatic processes, as I said, can be integrated with chemical steps rather easily, and we have several, several examples of that. Here is one that I already show in the case of, of ibuprofen, the same for naproxen, in which there is a previous chemical synthesis, but the enzymes is used in this case to uh, separate the, 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 the eutomer uh, from the distomer. Use robust commercially available hydrolase. I want to, to spend a little bit of time on that uh, uh, opportunity. And in this case, and only in this case, I will do some short reference to some of the things that we have done or are doing uh, in, the, in the field of enzyme biocatalysis. Lipases, proteases, glycosidases. Uh, these enzymes to act in, in reaction of synthesis need non-conventional medium. It means organic solvents, but you can also use high solids contents, okay, or neoteric solvents, supercritical fluids, ionic liquids, etc. Okay. Uh, lipases are very nice enzyme, very particular enzyme, because they behave quite differently from the rest of the enzyme, because lipases have been evolved to act naturally on non-aqueous or poorly aqueous environment. They, these are enzymes that act on interfaces or definitely in uh, more hydrophobic solvents. And the most, uh, no, not most, but many lipases have this uh, particular configuration in which they have uh, two alternative configuration. One, which is the closed configuration in which a polypeptide change closes the active site and another open configuration in which this polypeptide change opens and leaves the active site uh, uh, available for, for the reaction. And interesting thing is that you can work on that and move that equilibrium. In general, lipases in hydrophobic environment or in contact with hydrophobic surfaces will go to the open configuration and will be active. See, that is, a, I would say, particular characteristic of lipases which makes them very uh, adequate for for reaction of synthesis. With lipases, which are enzymes that normally hydrolyzes uh, ester bonds in, 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 in lipid materials, can be used for esterification, transesterification, interesterification. Uh, sometime, some years ago, we were uh, involved in a process in which we were looking for selective transesterification with lipases. Next one. What, what we were after uh, was a process which was uh, connected with uh, one of the main uh, producers of uh, paper and pulp in Chile. Uh, uh, according to the craft process, in the craft process, produce uh, very contaminated uh, residues. But this, which is a chemical company, has very nice technologies for fractionation. So they produce different products from the different fractions coming from the from the the black liquor of the craft. And one of these fractions is called uh, uh, wood sterols, which is really a mixture of sterols, which has a double bond here, and stanols, which is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the molecule which this does not have this, this double bond. And uh, what we were looking was a, a, an enzyme which can uh, discriminate these two structures, okay? So act upon one of those and not on the other. Uh, particularly, we were interested in an enzyme which will be able to sterify the stanol fraction without uh, sterifying the sterol fraction. Why? Because if you, do, if you do that, we can separate these products. These products are so similar chemically that you cannot fractionate or uh, use uh, chemical steps to separate them then the idea was to make a difference so that we can now apply the conventional separation processes to, to uh, the chemical processes of separation to separate those, those products. The idea, digamos, was to treat the, this mixture of sterols and stanols with an immobilized li uh, lipase, then by uh, vapor di uh, vacuum distillation separate the, the unreacted fatty acid esters from the stanol and sterol esters, and then by molecular distillation, separate sterols and stanol esters. These operations are conventional operations for the chemical industries which we, we were working with. So there was uh, not much of a problem 
to run these uh, uh, molecular distillation processes. And this allowed us to separate a sterile fraction and a stannol ester fraction. The stannol ester fraction goes to the nutraceutical market. The sterile fraction hopefully goes to the market for steroidal drugs. This is what we obtain. Actually, the, the, what the, the enzyme does is a rather kinetic resolution. Really, the enzyme can sterify both products, but it makes it at completely different rates. So you can essentially sterify most of the stannol fraction with a very little esterification of the sterile fraction. And that was the idea. Okay? The idea was to be able to obtain conditions in which we can do that separation. This was optimized. We produced catalysts to do that. Uh, we used also uh, commercial catalysts. And uh, we end up with, with an enzyme from alkaligenes, which was the only one in the screening of more than 20 commercial liposids that really worked uh, in, in, this, in the selection of this uh, reaction of esterification. This is a semi-happy story. Uh, it, uh, it was successful in a sense, and unfortunately not so successful in another but it was a problem of, of, of selling the, 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 the technology because this was sold quite nicely, but we have problems, the company has problems trying to, to sell that, that the idea of, you, of replacing uh, soya uh, sterols stero, for this kind of sterols, even though the product we were producing is much nicer than the sterols from soy. So the, there was some kind of, of, of industrial problem that in definite, in, in, what, 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 what the, the final story was that the, this company opt for a, a complete sterification, not specific sterification. It, they sterified the whole thing, so they produce a mixture of stannol and sterol esters to sell it as nutraceutical. This, is pro this process is, uh, is going on, but this is not so interesting from our point of view because the nice thing is the selectivity of the reaction, and now you can do that with any, no, not with any, but with many lipases, you can do a, a sterification which is not selective, but you have a very high yield of sterification, and you can formulate this, uh, this nutraceutical. Well, penicillin acylase, as I said, is a very nice enzyme. We have worked with it. Uh, this is not relevant. Uh, you say this is the enzyme that produces six amino penicillinic acid by hydrolysis, but you can use it to produce uh, uh, derived penicillins or cephalosporins. In this case, actually the enzyme, when, when doing synthesis, works better on amino cephalosporanic acid rather than amino penicillinic acid, which gives you the opportunity of producing uh, derived cephalosporins, which are much interesting in terms of, from a pharmaceutical point of view. And you use this enzyme not to break the bond, but to create the bond and produce then the, the, the antibiotic. Okay. This is actually a kinetically controlled reaction because you use the acyl donor, you use the, the activated acyl donor, so you break the, the, the thermodynamics of the reaction and you produce a kinetically controlled reaction which has the benefit that you can obtain conversions higher than the equilibrium and you can obtain that higher concentration in a shorter time. The problem is that you have to be careful not to continue beyond that because the hydrolysis will take over. So it's a rather more sophisticated process, but you can get a very nice uh, advantage. Okay, okay we, we, we worked for several years, uh, as well as the Jordanos in that time, in that, ter uh, in that uh, system. And we use uh, organic medium co-solvents. We tested a lot of co-solvents. Ethylene glycol was a very nice co-solvent. Uh, we can get higher conversions and uh, avoid the, the, the impact of hydrolysis by using this uh, ethylene glycol medium. But this was done when we were using rather moderate substrate concentrations. Okay, this is 90 millimolar uh, phenylglycine, for instance. The, the nice thing, next one, is that when you go to very much higher substrate concentration, the hydrolytic potential gets diminished. So, in reality, you don't need the co-solvent 
with, with the problems associated in terms of cost and environment, and environment you can avoid the, the use of this cost solvent by working at very high substrate concentration. And you can work at very high substrate concentrations. We went up to a concentration as high as 600 millimolar phenylglycine methyl ester. And you can see that if you compare the, 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 the aqueous medium with the co-solvent medium, you will see that the differences are quite slight. The, the conversion yield is a little bit lower, but the productivity is much higher. So the, 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 the final conclusion is that you can work in a completely aqueous environment, which is environmentally sound, and produce uh, uh, the, the product of synthesis at comparable conditions when using a, 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 an organic medium. Okay. The other benefit of working in, in aqueous medium is that the uh, stability is much more higher, it's much higher, you see. Uh, you can see here if you compare, for instance, these two values, the, the half lifetime of the, 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 the enzyme in aqueous medium is 2,480 2, hours compared to a little bit more than 800 hours for the, for the enzyme in the, in the co-solvent medium. Glycosidases. We have been involved for the last, I would say, six years in a, in a project which is aimed to exploit the possibilities of using glycosidase, but to produce uh, uh, oligosaccharide. And we have been uh, next slide. we have been working with uh, uh, prebiotic substances derived from lactose by using beta galactosidase, a very well known enzyme which is used routinely by the food industry for the production of low, low lactose milk and, and, and milk products and dairies. But the idea here is to use the enzyme not to hydrolyze lactose, but to produce uh, oligosaccharides derived from lactose. And among these uh, uh, oligosaccharides derived from lactose, you have the galacto-oligosaccharides, lactulose, and more recently we are working on fructosyl galacto oligosaccharides, which we say simply F-GOS. Well, prebiotics, I imagine that you're familiar with the concept. Prebiotics are selectively fermented ingredients that uh, allow changes in composition and activity of the gastrointestinal microbiota, conferring benefits upon well-being, health and well-being. That's the definition of a prebiotic. Let's say that the prebiotic is a chemical molecule that stimulates the beneficial microbiota while depressing the bad micro, uh, microbiota. That's, that's the, the idea of, of a prebiotic. And you have several oligosaccharides uh, that uh, fulfill the requirement to be con considered as prebiotics. I put here, I would say, the five, the five or six that are proven uh, unambiguously that they have prebiotic uh, capacity. And uh, if you see, this is a rather old uh, uh, paper published by one of the leading groups in that field, which is the, the work of uh, the group of Gibson and Rycroft in uh, University of uh, Reading in, in England. And they, uh, you have two, two more. Okay, no, no. <laughs> okay, if you see this uh, pre prebiotic index, which is a measurement of the possible prebiotic uh, activity, uh, you see that uh, lactulose, which is here, and, go and galacto-oligosaccharides are in a very good position if compared with other prebiotics that are more uh, routinely used in the, in the, in the food industry, like inulin, for instance. Okay, next one. Well, the, the idea of, of, uh, of incorporating these prebiotics in, 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 in foods uh, is to a certain extent uh, related to the functional food market, and you can see that the functional food market has increased almost exponentially uh, during the last years. To, to Just to mention the, the market in Japan, oligosaccharides for prebiotic action amounts about 70,000 tons per year, from which oligosaccharides represent a little bit more than 10, 15 percent of that figure. So this is this is not merely uh, a mode. It's, it's something that uh, apparently reflects 
the impact uh, of the modern habits of, 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 uh, of, uh, of eating that people have. So uh, this maybe will uh, last for a long time and the, the idea of this, uh, the, the open market opportunity for these functional foods is going to be there for, for some time. So it is it's not just a wave, <laughs> it's, it's more than a wave. Uh, well, these are, these are the, the, the galacto-oligosaccharides, lactulose and, and fructo-galacto-oligosaccharides. This is a, is, a, is a kinetically controlled process in which lactose acts both as donor and acceptor. So the enzyme first uh, separates the glucose from the lactose and the enzyme galactose complex can be then uh, react with another molecule of lactose, and then you are forming the, the galacto-oligosaccharide, GOS3, GOS4, and so on. But this reaction always will be competing with the reaction of hydrolysis, okay? Because this enzyme galactosyl complex can be hydrolyzed. So in the, in, in what you have is a kinetically controlled process in which you have to compete with the reaction of hydrolysis by the reaction of synthesis. And in this case, the way to do it is, again, to work at very high substrate concentration. Reduce the amount of water, reduce the activity of water to prevent the, uh, the, the hydrolysis of the, of, of, of the enzyme galactosyl complex and of the products which are produced. Next one. Well, we have worked for some time with this. We have tested different enzymes, enzymes from Aspergillus oryxae, from Bacillus circulans, Pleuromyces lactis, and you will see that the profile uh, of, 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 of these enzymes is completely different. For instance, the enzyme from Aspergillus oryzae is a very nice enzyme for producing lactulose. It produces very little uh, disaccharides, GOS2. It produces uh, a significant amount of GOS3 and GOS4. These are the products that are mostly associated with the pre prebiotic effects. The prebiotic effects of disaccharides have not been proven. So the idea is to produce as much GOS3 and GOS4 than you, than you, than you can. So you see, for instance, that the enzyme from Clibromyces lactis, on the other hand, this is a very good enzyme for doing hydrolysis, but it is not a good enzyme for performing synthesis because most of the products are uh, these disaccharides, and you have a very little production of uh, trisaccharides, tetrasaccharides, and in the case of the synthesis of lactulose, the, 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 the capacity of producing lactulose is very mild. The, ca the, ca go ahead. the, the case of... Uh, of uh, Bacillus circulans is uh, rather different. They produce a lot of trisaccharides, some tetrasaccharides, little disaccharides. So they are interesting uh, enzymes for producing galacto-oligosaccharides, but very poor enzymes for producing lactulose. For so each enzyme has its own pattern, and this is very important to, to realize. Well, we have selected for our work in most cases, the enzyme from Aspergillus oryzae, because besides that characteristic, this is a very nice enzyme, it's very cheap, it's available to us, uh, it's very stable, much more stable than the other enzyme. It's a, it's a monomer, which simplifies things a little bit. The enzyme from Bacillus uh, circulans is, uh, there are three isoenzymes at least, so it makes more complicated things, especially when you try to immobilize the enzyme. And this is a final resort uh, that, that we did when we were optimizing the synthesis of galacto-oligosaccharides with immobilized beta-galactosidase. We end up with a result that allows us to produce uh, about 8.5 kilos of GOS per gram of catalyst, which is a rather nice figure. And this is considering only 10 sequential batches at the end of which the uh, specific activity is still 75% of the initial. So we can, if we extrapolate this result, we can produce about 25,000 grams of GOS per gram of catalyst. So this is 25 kilos per, kilo per gram of catalyst. This is a rather nice figure. We, uh, we use the models that uh, Isabel was talking because uh, the student, after 10 sequential batches, doesn't want to listen anymore about this. So we can keep on doing sequential batches, but this is impossible, so we modeled the system and we projected this. Uh, the, the, the model was rather nice, so we can do a reasonable projection that comes to a figure which is rather, 
rather good for you. Next one. Other nice thing is that the product that we produce has a pattern which is similar to the leading products in the market. In this case, these products are already in the market, so you have to compete in terms of cost, in terms of efficiency. But you see that in terms of composition, our uh, product, either with the immobilized or with the soluble enzyme, has a composition which is quite similar to the product cop oligo, a little bit different from the product from Bibinal, which has a lower amount of, of, of ghost tree and a little bit higher amount of higher oligosaccharides. But as you see, there are not much significant difference in the quality of product that we can produce. Well, we are continue doing uh, work on that. This is, we have done some engineering work on that. There's no much time to, to, to go into that. And this is the process that we are uh, faced. We have optimized the, the enzymatic synthesis step, and we are now working on the purification. And this is a very critical issue in the production of, of this uh, product. So uh, right now we are working on purification by doing different alternatives to obtain a high quality goss, okay? Uh, the, 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 the main thing is to remove uh, the, the monosaccharides because some hydrolysis always occurs. So you have galactose and you have glucose and you have, for certain applications, you have to remove it. So we are now working on that and specifically we have had very, very good results in selective fermentation. This is for the case of lactulose. I don't want, I won't go into any detail, but the thing interesting in, in the case of the synthesis of lactulose is, is that when you, add suc uh, when you add fructose to the lactose, you will produce a mixture of lactulose and galacto-oligosaccharides. Both are prebiotic. And the question is, is there a particular ratio among them that produces the highest prebiotic effect? To answer that question, one of our uh, doctorate students went to the laboratory of Rastal in the University of, uh, of Reading and did, there, the, did all these experiments of testing the prebiotic effect and it, we end up with a, an optimum gos lactulose ratio in terms of prebiotic effect. And the nice thing is that if you know that, the thing is that you can tune your reaction to obtain precisely that ratio. And the, the variable which is more uh, important to control is the ratio, obviously, of lactose to fructose. So by tuning the substrate ratio, you obtain a definite product ratio, and you can tune it the way you want. So we can produce lactulose gauss of any composition by working with, with the simple uh, uh, dosification of the substrate. This is a very interesting work that we have done in the last couple of years. Just to be closing my, my presentation, I would say to, uh, to end up by stressing again that the future of enzyme biocatalysis, in my modest opinion, tomorrow I think John will give you his impression about that, and you better listen to him <laughs> than to me. But in my opinion, I think these are two areas in which enzyme biocatalysis should have a much more uh, important impact, which is the field of enzyme inorganic synthesis, particularly in pharmaceutical, but also in other fine chemicals, and as I said, enzyme in biofuel production. Next one. Uh, I, I, I'm not an, an, an expert in, in, in the field of organic chemistry and the production of, of, of pharmaceutical, but I would like to uh, present this table, which is taken from a very recent paper from a group in the Universidad Complutense de Madrid when they did a kind of survey in which they simply look at processes that have been taken by companies to move to a productive stage. And you will see that in, in this type of processes, lipases play a very important role because lipases are very versatile enzymes and again, they can work under non-conventional media, which is very important for organic synthesis. And you will see, a, no, go back. Go back. Yeah. You will see that there are a lot of products which are considering enzymes at least in one of the steps of production. And let's put, let's fix our attention. For instance, in the case of paclitaxel, which one of the, the steps can be done by an, an enantioselective hydrolysis or a racemate precursor. Paclitaxel is a very important anti-cancer drug. Uh, 
well, ibuprofen, uh, beta blockers, delta assembly, a, a lot of very important pharmaceutical drugs in which are produced by enzyme catalysis at least in one of the steps of production. The thing is that uh, these enzymes, uh, 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 more, most of these enzymes have been worked to a certain extent by some uh, protein engineering techniques. And here comes the second and the third wave of von Scheuer, when you are using now enzymes, but you are tuning their capacity to act on non-natural substrate, but to do so efficiently, you will have to probably change the natural uh, structure of the enzyme, and you can do the, this right now by the modern techniques of protein engineering, and I'm sure that uh, John will speak a little bit about uh, that subject uh, tomorrow. The other in interesting thing is that now other enzymes, which are no longer hydrolytic enzymes, come into play. Okay, so you can see some dehydrogenases, which, re remember, are coenzyme requiring enzymes. So these are much elaborated processes, but no now some of them are going into industrial uh, application. And you will see that in this case, uh, dehydrogenase uh, ketoreductases are necessarily enzymes that, be, that have in, been improved by protein engineering techniques, which in this case is, I would say, necessary because the natural enzymes are no longer able to do this kind of, of a reaction. So in this case, second and third wave of enzyme biocatalysis. Now you need to use these techniques to improve your enzymes. Your natural enzymes are no longer capable of doing this. You need to improve them. And you will see that here there are very, very important uh, uh, pharmaceutical products like the case of Montelukast. Montelukast is a drug uh, which is used for, for asthma. Uh, is uh, I think, the, in 2010, it was the ninth most sold drug in the world. So it's a very important drug. And uh, you will see here the case of atorvastatin. Atorvastatin is a cholesterol-lowering uh, drug. Uh, in 2010, it was considered number one pharmaceutical drug, at, at least chiral pharmaceutical drug, sold. And now atorvastatin is considering at least one and up to three steps of enzymatic synthesis of the precursor of that molecule. So this is very nice. But again, you see, these enzymes have to be intensively worked by uh, protein engineering techniques. And then you can see some, I would say, very interesting association be between pharmaceutical companies and companies like Codexis, which are devoted to improve catalysts, to improve enzyme catalysts. So they are working on, 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 on a tight uh, relationship between the, the producers of the, of the drug and the producers of the catalyst for doing that, such drug. And you will see another, uh, other examples of, the, of products which are very, very important for the pharmaceutical industry. And other enzymes, which are not longer hydrolases, and uh, there are no dehydrogenases, then comes into play transaminases. Transaminases are enzymes that have been very, very a little exploded for, for biocatalysis, but right now, with the, with the help of these uh, protein engineering techniques, you can engineer transaminase to do this reaction of synthesis and producing, for instance, product like citagliptin, which is a, is a glucose-lowering agent for diabetic treatment, and, uh, well, uh, other products. This is not properly a pharma product, this uh, monatin. Monatin is a very, very potent uh, um, um, sweetener, which is, uh, comes from a, from a tree, in, I guess, I guess a tree, tree in Africa, and the idea is now to produce it uh, by, by chemical synthesis because uh, the, 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 the yield of extraction of this uh, uh, sweetener from the tree makes no, not much of sense, but now some uh, 
uh, this is being produced by, uh, by chemical synthesis. And in some of these, there are some enzymes involved. In this case, very interesting, they are using a protease, a protease which is sublilicin, and uh, the, the, this enzyme is immobilized uh, by cross-linking, so it's a clack of subtilizing, which is being used in the production of these two drugs. Next one. So, uh, some, some take-home messages with respect to the use of enzymes in organic chemistry. I would say that there is a great potential of enzymes as catalysts for organic synthesis, and I'm sure, I hope, that uh, John will stress this, this, this fact tomorrow. Um, this is because they are, ex they are very much selective. They are rather promiscuous catalysts, and this is very nice because it, seems, uh, it, it means that the enzyme can act on a variety of substrates and will express a variety of activities. Uh, they are highly active under mild condition. They comply with the principles of green chemistry. So uh, these are things that obviously represent a, a potential. Uh, maybe the, the, the enzyme will be mostly used for the production of pharmaceutical and agrochemical precursor and other fine chemical products. Uh, Non-aqueous biocatalysis will necessarily have to be conducted in, in greener solvents than today. Uh, mostly hydrolysis will be using, but no longer exclusively. So now other enzymes come into play. No, not only hydrolysis, but other, other enzymes as well. Uh, what are some requirements? It is needed more active and stable enzymes in non-conventional media. This is something that needs to be improved, uh, but the, the tools of protein engineering and catalyst engineering are tools that can be applied to, to, to tackle this problem. Uh, cheaper neoteric green solvents are required. Ionic liquid, liquids have proven to be very, very interesting uh, green solvents, but they are too expensive now. So. Uh, we need cheaper neoteric green solvents. Uh, maybe more effective product separation system are still required. This is more or less an engineering requirement. And, uh, well, development of multi-enzyme systems is, is maybe required to make uh, uh, cascade reactions, and this is, can be very nice. And there's also some development needed in, in that area. Uh, Maybe to, 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 to end up the, the, this idea of organic uh, synthesis is to stress the idea that maybe in the future the use of protein engineering techniques will become more and more important because we are trying that enzymes do with what they do not do naturally. And this needs, obviously, the, 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 to apply these this, uh, interesting techniques. Uh, John wrote uh, recently a very, very nice paper. It's short, as good papers should be. I think it was published in the current opinion in biological chemistry, or, okay. This is a very nice, uh, 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 very nice paper in the sense that I would say it's a, to a certain extent enlightening, and uh, I think it focused uh, the problem very nicely in the sense that the improvement of the catalyst needs necessarily to be done with respect to, to its use. So the parameters that are normally used to, 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 to see the progress of the, of, the, of the protein engineering techniques should be related with parameters of operation of such enzymes. Then behavior under high substrate concentrations, uh, considering the, the, the thermodynamics of the reaction and other things that are normally not included in the traits that we're using are important to be considered because we will be joining together the catalyst improvement but looking at their application. I think this is something that is, I think it's very good to say to, to the community which is working in, in, in protein engineering. For me, it was quite, quite... Uh, provoking quite in life. Just one comment to, to end up my presentation is that, uh, well, th 
this is the cathedral of bioethanol. So speaking about bioethanol in Brazil, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm rather afraid to speak about bioethanol in Brazil. But in, in Chile, we are working in a, in a rather ambitious project for producing bioethanol, second generation bioethanol from woody materials. Why? Because uh, Chile has no chance to produce biofuels from other sources, okay? But we have huge forestry resources. Well, I said I won't pro pronounce the word huge in Brazil because in Brazil everything is huge, you know? <laughs> Chile is about 10% of Brazil in almost everything, size, population. In football, we are less than 1%, but in the, <laughs> in the last one, we are about 10%, okay? 10% of population, 10% of area, 10% of everything. So what is huge for us, maybe it's not huge for you, but the, 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 the wood producing potential of Chile is very impressive for the size of the country. And uh, uh, the technology for producing pulp and paper is very well developed in Chile, and there are plenty of, of, of technology that can be used to uh, transform these this wood materials into bioethanol and other products of biorefineries. So we have been working for about three years, four years now in a process for producing uh, bioethanol from woody materials, and we have studied all the, the, the technical operation, pretreatment, enzymatic hydrolysis and fermentation, uh, distillation a little bit, but also we have done some modeling to, to, to evaluate the process, to do some economic calculation and to do some life cycle analysis of the alternatives we are managing right now. Uh, maybe we will finish this first step of the process in about two years, in which we will have a demonstration plant for producing ethanol according to the process we have developed. Uh, we already produced the first two liters of bioethanol from wood in Chile, so. <laughs> and I have a bottle of 100 milliliters in my office. <laughs> I am in charge in the, in the hydrolysis uh, step of, of the process. Uh, we have been lucky enough to sign an agreement with Novozymes, your neighbors here in Araquara, to use the very good enzyme. So the hydrolysis step is very nicely taken. We are working uh, with, uh, with pulps uh, of 20% and we go, can go up to 25% solids. So what was talking Jonathan is true, but you can do it if you had good enzymes, and uh, what, what happens is that you start with a paste. You cannot agitate, you have to use a, a mixer of, of, of dough. To, to, but after one or two hours, this is completely liquefied, so you can work as a conventional reactor, but you need good enzymes to do that. So the hydrolytic step has been very rewarding because we are working with very nice enzymes from uh, Novozyme, but also from, from DuPont from Genencore, they have very good catalyst now. And the, the, the hydrolytic step is crucial because the enzymes are very expensive. You know, cellulases are complex, are lazy enzymes. So these new enzymes, which are enzyme cocktails, which are very well tuned to, to hydrolyze uh, cellulosic material, lignocellulosic materials, I think it's a step forward. It's a very big step forward in the production of second generation bioethanol. And if you see what is happening in the world, there are some plants already operation, operating at a large scale. And by 2015, I think there are 10 big plants which are supposed to be working on the production of bioethanol from lignocellulose. Uh, Brazil is, is very, very well prepared for that. And I think Brazil will be the main challenger of the United States in, the, in, in, this, in this field. So. To speak about bioethanol in Brazil, as I said, is kind of complicated, but uh, because you are leading this, this, this subject and uh, we hope you will win the race against the United States. The agencies which we work with, this is CONICID, Fondesid, Innova, Chile, these are all governmental agencies which uh, help financially. We have a very close tie with the Institute of Catalysis in Madrid with the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. We have joint pro projects and also with our dear friends of Argentina, CITCA in La Plata, Sindefit 
also in La Plata. We have uh, joint projects with all of them. These are the main people who work in the field. Uh, there's, I think, a, a photograph of the group. Yeah, you see that women's uh, took over, <laughs> but we have some males also. <laughs> This, this, these are two of my colleagues, uh, postdocs, doctoral students, and uh, also master students, which is now the, 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 the group who work in, in biocatalysis. Okay, this is the front of our school. Some of you know Isabel, Enrique. Uh, this is all, something interesting. This is what we call Nucleo de Biotecnología. This is a center of biotechnology of our university. It has two blocks, it's supposed to go to four blocks, and this is a very nice uh, idea because this is a center which takes our results and project it to the, to the productive sector. So it's a linkage between academia and the productive sector, and they are very active, and they help us a lot because Enrique pointed out, professors are not very good for doing business, so we have people who, know li very little about science, but they are very good in doing business. So this is a very nice uh, relationship that we have with the nuclear of biotechnology. Well, this is diversity in the country. Thank you very much for your attention and my excuse. Just from my other experience in mixing, how do you plan to solve the mixing of the 25% solids at the industrial scale? We have, haven't done much engineering on the problem, but we have designed a hybrid, hybrid agitator in which you have a spiral mixer for solids. Yeah, and you have a conventional stirrer, and you can operate them separately. So during the first two hours, you uh, mix this mass, and then when it liquefies, you use a conventional agita agitation system. The, the thing is that we are doing two different uh, process strategies. We, one is sim uh, sequential saccharification, and fermentation, and the other is simultaneous sacrification and fermentation. And in the simultaneous sacrification and fermentation, what we do is that the first step of liquefaction and a little bit of sacrification, we did it under one condition in one reactor and then moved to a second reactor when fermentation occurs, but also uh, um, cellulose keeps on being hydrolyzed by the enzymes, you see? But, uh, there's much engineering that we have to put in that, in that system. But, but that's the general idea. We have done this at laboratory scale, and uh, we will move to a pre-pilot stage then when we will see how to deal with the, the problem of, of mixing. But the system mixed very well, okay? Mixed very well in the sense that you can take samples and they are homogeneous in, in composition. So the mixing is good. The mixing is, it seems not to be a problem. The other thing is the energy you're putting in your, in, in your mixing system. But as, as I said, we are doing in parallel all the economic analysis and the life cycle analysis and all things like that because this is fundamental. So the, the economics of the thing is being also considered because, yeah, the, this expenditure of energy may be uh, high, but it's for a very short time. That's, that's very nice because the hydrolysis took, can take 20 hours. But in two hours, you have completely liquefied your system as long as you have good enzymes <laughs> you see? In, in a dose which is not very high. And you can, you can manage the, 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 the system. But yeah, we will find when we scale up this, maybe we will move to add a different reactor configuration. Your opinion is very valuable. Maybe we'll go to a rotary drum or I don't know, other, other type of, of reactor when we move to a higher scale. This is also being studied, not for my group, but it's also being studied. I would like to know what means uh, not very high enzyme concentration to have uh, liquefaction, full liquefaction in just uh, one or two hours. Uh, I don't have the figures in, in my mind, but I can tell you that we have reduced the enzyme to solid concentration significantly from the first generation of enzyme to third generation of enzyme. We start working with the NS uh, series of, of novel science. I'm not sure well aware with that. Maybe you are. Then with Silic C2 and Silic C3. 
and uh, you can reduce the enzyme dosage quite significantly. I don't have the numbers in my mind, but okay. I can give you the numbers if you want to know them. There are not surprising uh, figures for an enzyme process. If you always put, say, one gram of enzyme per 100 grams or more of, of, of solids in this case. So it's, it's, it's not different from the doses that you may have in other similar process like and what kind of treatment do you have done? Pre-treatment, yes. yes. Well, we are working with three different pre-treatments. One is the organosol, which we are not longer used. The other is uh, skin explosion that for economical reasons we will not use. And the other is uh, auto-hydrolysis, uh, soft uh, acid hydrolysis which, uh, according to our results, our calculation is the best uh, system of pretreatment. Uh, we are also using, uh, besides wood chips, which are pretreated, we are also using uh, cellulose refuse from the big uh, uh, paper and pulp uh, producing uh, uh, companies. Okay. The nice thing about that is that this project is a consortium in which the, 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 the academics are working together with the, the, this main uh, pop of paper industries in Chile. So we have access to all the products. They are working with us in this, uh, in this, in this project. And uh, an idea that uh, we, don't, we didn't have at the beginning, but now is taking, uh, taking strength, is to use the refuse. I mean, the, the, the fineness of cellulose that cannot be used for producing paper okay. is fantastic because it's almost pure cellulose. It means no it is a, it, yeah. very, very little lignin, very little hemicellulose. So it's, let's say, 95 or 90 percent cellulose. And this is first class food for, for the system. <laughs> and the other thing is, they, they will say, but well, this is not very important in terms of quantity. The amounts that are produced are really, really, really big. So you are solving a problem of, of waste and producing an output, uh, which for the time being is ethanol, but can be other products by refinery. So maybe it will make more sense for producing things different than bioethanol, but this is a this is a next step. This is this is next step. Okay. Yeah, but these are very big quantities that are produced, uh, and uh, they are very nice. The, the only problem is that they have a little bit high content of acetic acid. So the problem is the guys who work in fermentation because yes. the, the, the the acetic acid is, is rather a problem. We are working now with some strains that are much more resistant to acetic acid. So. As long as we can use these strains for producing ethanol, the problem will not be so important. But, uh, but yes, the acetic acid is the problem. When you use uh, wood, when you pre-treat the wood, you have other compounds that make noise. And uh, you have to, to take care of that. This, uh, the people, the fermentation group deals with that, with that problem. Makes nothing to the enzymes. Uh, the enzymes are resistant. You put whatever in the enzyme, work perfectly. The problem is when, you, when we deliver our syrup to the fermentation. They have some problems that are trying to be solved by both better strains and also some operational tricks to try to avoid the enzymes. But I'm not expert in the fermentation space, so I cannot say too much about that. Okay, thank you.